Hello, can you hear me? Okay, yes, and Sita, how are you? I can see you online. Is it okay yes. if you uh, turn your cameras on and leave them on during the panel so we can have you in the room properly? Yes, I'm opening my camera now. Excellent, and I will just wait for the tech support to show you on the screen so we can have your presence here. Okay. Can we work that out? Hi, Mr. Park. Hi, Ms. Laksimi. <laughs> so. Oh, perfect. We have you on the screen now. Uh, K.S. Sita, fantastic. And uh, who else do we have online? Has Pak Farham joined as well? Is he online? I don't, I don't see. Oh, fabulous. So let's wait for everyone to be ready and then we can start. Is that okay? Yes. So we might uh, have the fortune to have a Minister of Communications, uh, Ntati Murosi from Lesotho. So that would be a fabulous addition to the panel. And we will have a member of parliament uh, from Indonesia, Pak Farham. I'm not sure if um, he has joined yet. One more minute and then we start, or we start now. Uh, Sita is saying she's going to join in a few minutes. Oh, the minister. Okay. Please let me know when uh, she does. And then let's just officially start this panel. Um, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land and which we meet today. Uh, I would also like to pay my respects to elders past, uh, present, and those emerging. I also acknowledge that we have a number of parties joining us by Zoom uh, today from uh, Indonesia, hopefully Lesotho, uh, Korea, but I think KS is in California and we can see a fabulous suntan on his face, amazing. <laughs> it's a very sunny day here in Brisbane, uh, but we are in a windowless room, um, but hopefully we can bring some light uh, to uh, a complex uh, problem. Um, uh, the problem is countering misinformation and disinformation in fast growing online communities. And uh, we have a formidable uh, panel. Um, we have Richard Windeer, Deputy Secretary of Communications. I have met uh, Richard many years ago. I respect uh, you very deeply. Uh, you never uh, shy away from a solid intellectual policy discussion, and I just um, respect uh, your prowess on all policy matters. And I think they come very much uh, in action because uh, the purpose of this parliamentary track uh, in the context or uh, as uh, together with the Asia Pacific Regional Internet Governance Forum is to bridge together policy and technologists and practitioners. And uh, I actually don't know many with the same level of experience as Richard to be able to bridge that as you have been working on that for many, many years. Um, and we also have uh, very good friends uh, from Korea, OpenNet and Sita from Diplo. And if I uh, might suggest, uh, actually, I think they can, uh, put a good frame for the discussion so we can start. I know that Sita has a presentation and maybe KS Park uh, as well uh, to set the problem, set 
the uh, perspectives from um, practitioners, experts, researchers, uh, and, and from there we can um, uh, work how to bridge uh, practitioners with policy. Is that an okay way to go? Um, so why don't I pass uh, the microphone um, uh, for you to uh, talk about OpenNet uh, and introduce KS. Okay. Um, my, after my introduction, KS will speak. Okay. Yeah. Hello, my name is Kyung Mi Oh, working at OpenNet Korea as a researcher. I'm happy to join this session. I'm here with KS Park participating in this session remotely. He is one of our executive members and a law professor at Korea University of Law. Yeah, Open Air Korea was founded in January 2013 as a digital human rights organization. It aims to protect the internet as a space for openness and sharing. It aims to protect freedom of speech, privacy, intellectual property regime conductive to access to knowledge and culture, and network neutrality protection and promoting people's right to access to internet. Open that internet, um, uh, open internet where business transaction take place free of unreasonable regulations so that the internet can contribute to economic equality and fairness. And, for the rest, for the last, internet government protective all of the above values. To that end, OpenNet Korea lobbies for and against legislative bills, litigates for social impacts, educate the public, conduct research, build domestic and in international L alliances and concert with government officials and politicians. Founders of OpenNet were successful in taking down the false news crime, which was used and abused by South Korean re regime in suppressing dissident voices and people in 2010. Writing on that tradition, OpenNet was successful in 2021 in enlisting the help of UN Special Rapporteur Irene Khan and thereby pushing back against the new legislation which would have imposed punitive damages for defamation on news reporting. When the wrongdoing reported, there is not imposed the same. Yes, KS, Mike is over to KS, all right. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I, uh, um, yes, it's open net, uh, open. Okay, uh, some questions came in. Um, anyway, uh, so we need to talk about uh, countering this information and misinformation. Um, although uh, we want to talk about the latest trends, um, seeing uh, parliamentarians in the audience, uh, I cannot shake off the temptation to uh, kind of uh, strengthen the fundamentals on our approach to this information. Uh, number one is criminalizing speech for being false uh, is not a way to uh, is not a good response to this information. Um, human rights literature from decades ago is full of examples, full of examples how the law against uh, false information has been abused by political power, uh, the political regimes in power to uh, suppress dissident voices and people. Um, and it's full of uh, um, judicial and human rights uh, uh, entities uh, that uh, have uh, acknowledged that fact, acknowledged the historical fact of uh, abuse of uh, 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 abuse of uh, criminal laws uh, against uh, this information. And uh, I mean, the reason is that um, 
the reason is not uh, just the, the 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 problem doesn't just come from uh, abuse uh, by uh, bad political leaders, but also uh, comes from uh, the problem of excessiveness. There are many times. There are many times that intentional falsity is a very effective tool for civic discourse. Uh, environmental activists uh, engage in a poetic exaggeration of uh, the uh, scientific impact of uh, various uh, pollu uh, various industrial uh, pollution. Um, in order to engage the public, in order to uh, in order to get people's attention and bring them into serious discussion. Um, if we start criminalizing uh, speech for simply being false, that, that will shut people up, uh, that will shut down the rhetoric of uh, many activists working for uh, public good. So the first, uh, uh, of course, there are many intentional falsities uh, that will uh, that will cause harm um, that uh, need be addressed. Um, however, uh, criminalizing uh, is not a proportionate uh, solution because once you start uh, once you start saying you know, there are bad falsities and there are good, good falsities, then the government has to make a decision, has to make a value judgment uh, between good speech and bad speech. And the government has to become thought police, has, uh, has to be, the government has to, uh, the government can no longer become a neutral arbiter. Um, the government has to, um, uh, really uh, lose its uh, neutral uh, status in people's uh, uh, ability to uh, express uh, and share their information. So uh, that, that's, that's one big lesson that we have to uh, live with. Now that leads us to the question, then what can we do when there are clear disinformation that are causing harm. Um, I mean, the first that I mean, before Trump, we thought that this information uh, actually causing harms is uh, uh, only the happenings within the uh, third world or global south or uh, where the democracy is uh, very weak. Uh, but the Trump and Capitol Hill, uh, Capitol Hill attack showed uh, how this information can actually translate into uh, physical harms. Now, we need to uh, think about uh, how to uh, respond to this. Um, and we, uh, we should not, uh, uh, we should not, limit ourselves, we should not limit ourselves in uh, coming up with uh, effective ways to law. We should not limit ourselves to law. Um, one of the reasons that uh, this information uh, ha it becomes so harmful is the rate of propagation, um, rate of propagation through the internet. The internet was uh, um, in the past, only 10 years ago, it was the tool for democracy fighters. Um, we cited internet as a catalyst for Jasmine Revolution in Middle East. We nominated internet for Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, now, in the past decade, anti-democratic forces learned how to use the internet and the bad speech are, of course, propagating 
through the uh, intermediaries, uh, Twitter, uh, now it's called X, uh, Facebook, uh, et cetera. Now, if we hold, I mean, when we said, I, I, uh, I mean, just a minute ago, I said, criminalizing speech for being forced violates international human rights standard. Uh, but if we hold intermediaries to the same inter international human rights rule, intermediaries, their um, hands will be bound. They, it's their technology that is propagating both good information and bad information. And if we hold them to the same international, international human rights law that is applied to the governments, then intermediaries cannot use the technology to respond to uh, this information. And intermediaries need be uh, able to do more than, able to do more than what uh, uh, international human rights law allows. Um, many, much false speech is protected speech under international human rights law. Just uh, today, uh, Facebook uh, oversight board opened for public comment, um, public comment on their disposition of uh, um, Holocaust uh, denier. Uh, I'm not taking side on whether that decision was uh, right or not. But what is clear is that uh, Facebook and intermediaries should be given freedom to go beyond uh, what international human rights law allows, meaning they should be able to take down, suppress, de-amplify the speech that is protected speech under uh, human rights law. Now, that, that's, that's the second uh, aspect, um, the, uh, uh, the speech protection, uh, speech protection that was applied to the governments uh, should not be applied to the platforms. Platforms should be given uh, more leeway. Uh, the, third, um, the third takeaway for me is that if, uh, the more and more intermediaries are uh, subject to the government's, the government's takedown request. Uh, Nets DG, Germany's Nets DG type of uh, mandatory takedown. Now, Nets DG is being copied all over Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand. Uh, the uh, the communication ministry uh, that was formally just setting the uh, technical standard and approving uh, broadcasters and approving network operators are now repurposing repurposing um, their uh, agency uh, and moving into content regulation. They are making specific orders to bring down or retain. Uh, certain postings. Now, if that is allowed, it will basically work against the freedom that I talked about in the, uh, in, in the second statement I made. Um, because then the governments can use the platforms to spread, uh, to, to engage, in, um, uh, engage in manipulation of a public discourse. Uh, retain pro, uh, you know, by retaining, by ordering retention of a pro-government speech uh, and by ordering takedown of uh, dissident uh, speech. So uh, that's uh, another concern. Now, the fourth uh, takeaway for, for me is that intermediaries uh, can do more, I mean, I talked about Trump and the Capitol Hill attack and Facebook and Twitter quickly deplatformed uh, uh, Trump's accounts, although they, uh, they were criticized for doing it too late, 
But again, that only shows how we were so confused about you know, what rules should be applicable to intermediaries. We were so uh, caught up with the idea that intermediaries somehow should act like governments and should, uh, should not uh, you know, should not take down uh, uh, Trump, uh, Trump account uh, because that would mean that the intermediaries uh, will be the king. And uh, it, 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 that, that, it, that goes, you know, we thought that that goes against free speech. That's what delayed the process uh, in the back office of Facebook and Twitter in deplatforming uh, Trump's account. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we should just let intermediaries do whatever they want. What is most difficult for the civil society? I, I think that is my uh, you know, fifth statement uh, that I wanna contribute to uh, this um, discussion is that it, a lack of uh, transparency, a lack of transparency. I mean, I, I think platforms should do more and can do more in content moderation. Uh, but we need to have clear picture of what the platform is doing so that we can properly escalate uh, the uh, uh, bad contents. Um, without having a transparency of what's being taken down, uh, we don't know. We don't know what, uh, we, what we can raise with a certain platform. We, uh, I think it's the last week that Internews published a report on how trusted flaggers system is broken. Well, all trusted fl flaggers uh, have almost one-to-one -one relationship with uh, 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 Facebook, uh, but they don't know what is being taken down and what is being retained. If the trusted flaggers have a better idea about what Facebook wants to do, then they can more efficiently, they can more efficiently raise, uh, escalate, uh, identify and escal escalate bad contents. Now, when it's clear from the disclosed data, when it's clear from the disclosed data that maybe uh, Facebook is not, you know, doing enough to uh, uh, respond to uh, this information, then we can make a uh, more global, uh, more uh, well-researched uh, suggestions on uh, you know, what should be taken down and what should be retained. Uh, we don't have that either. So I think we need more transparency on um, uh, the self-regulation that the uh, intermediaries are so proud of. I'll stop there, and uh, um, I have uh, uh, another statement to make, but I'll uh, save that for uh, the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Park. Uh, always happy to see you. Uh, five points about uh, criminalizing speech is not a good response. Uh, then, of course, we have to address this information uh, in some way or another. And then a very interesting and um, I think polemic uh, that I hope uh, those members of parliament and government can help to address whether intermediaries um, can have that leeway uh, that can even go beyond sort of international human rights. And what would be the checks and balances that platforms need to have uh, in order for them to be effective to counter this information. Uh, so that's a very good start of the conversation, and I would like to pass uh, the floor uh, to uh, my very good friend Sita, uh, currently at Diplo Foundation, but uh, an extraordinarily um, proactive, constructive, uh, and uh, most importantly, a glue to civil society in many internet governance discussions throughout the years. Welcome, Sita, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I would like to share screen. Uh, if you can check my screen. Uh, I think, yes, I think KS, I, I follow up what was KS was saying actually about the uh, uh, 
countering mis in this information, especially in the perspective of uh, internet inter intermediary liability. So I would like, in my 10 minutes, I would like to discuss with you uh, in divining which actually internet intermediary that has an effective role as well as responsibility in disseminating mis or disinformation. Yeah? So because there are so many uh, uh, characterized as uh, mis or disinformation. And, and first of all, Pablo, thank you very much for the introductions. And it's, it's an honor for me to be part of these conversations with the parliament members and with the ministers. Um, so yeah, back to the, back to the slide. Uh, so what is actually uh, internet intermediary? Uh, this is my own definitions. Uh, it's a loosely de definition uh, is an entity. So internet intermediary is an entity that provides services from one point to another on the internet. Uh, it could be in the form of infrastructures access to the internet and or facilitating two or more points in the transfer of data. Uh, the APC, the Association of Progressive Communications, uh, define it into two. One is as a conduits, which is a technical providers of the internet access. Uh, and basically conduits do not interfere with the content they are transmitting. Uh, and as a host, yeah, uh, providers of the content services, uh, for example, uh, online platform. I think what KS mentioned earlier, it's more into the online platform, but we can discuss it later. Um, so because most of the companies coming from the US, uh, so the internet intermediary liability uh, highly influenced by the, this section 230, the Communications Decision Act, which is basically um, uh, let, let go the responsibility of internet intermediary if they uh, just posting or so they're not responsible for, for what others say or do. And this includes from, uh, from the internet service provider, but also a range of interactive computer services. So I think that's one of the issues that we need to discuss as well, Pablo. Uh, if we would like to miss and this, uh, if we would like to counter the miss and disinformation, which internet intermediary that we are talking about, I think that's, that's one of the things we would like to talk. Uh, the, the the dynamics of the discussions. I I would like to also come from uh, what KS was mentioning uh, in the last decade. Yeah. So in 2015, I think Pablo was there in in Philippines in Manila. Uh, I uh, I was there as well. I think the civil society proposed this Manila principles, which basically requests that the intermediary should be shielded from the liability of the third party content. Uh, but then two, uh, two years later, uh, Teresa May um, uh, really call, uh, addressed the urgency for technology companies uh, to take further steps in tackling uh, terrorist content issue. Because in 2017, I think UK received more than four or four uh, terrorist uh, attack in one year. So she said, this, she said this in the UNGA. And as we all know, in 2018, there is this Cambridge Analytica scandal, which actually uh, personal data belongings to millions of Facebook has been collected without their consent by this company and for to be used for the political advertising. And this is revealed by its own uh, whistleblower, uh, Christopher. Uh, and also, like Kaes mentions about Capitol Hill attack, but what is the most important about this attack that this leads to the questions of the section 230 about the internet intermediate liability. So this brings the, the attention to this, to this issue. I think what we feel, Pablo, uh, and, and other speakers in this region is that we have been called for this content regulation for so long, but it was not really listened until this Capitol Hill attack happened. And then suddenly uh, all the companies starting to realize their, their liability on these issues. And, and the last but never the least is the Digital Service Act, which is basically, uh, which aim to create a safer and more open digital space, but really highly regulate the internet intermediary. And they mean here, especially the big tech company. Uh, so how about this region? Um, in Indonesia, we have three regulations. We have lots of regulations. 
uh, that can be related to the content regulations, but three is the most relevant one. One is the electronic information and transaction law. Uh, Zita, and under I, that I, is- Zita, I think you should turn the pages of the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, we are stuck with the cover page. Oh, you are stuck with the cover page? Yes. Yes. Oh. yes we oh. Perhaps you can turn the presentation mode, Sita. And um, ah, okay. Well, sorry. Yeah. If you can share your presentation afterwards, so we can catch up as well, would be fantastic. Okay. Well, just just wait a moment. Then let me I try again. Really, really want to see your presentation. <laughs> sorry. This is uh because perhaps I'm using to to. Now, can you see it? Yes, we can also see your talking points there. Um, okay, so it's better to switch into presentation mode. Yes, just wait a moment. Sorry. It's a Sorry mess with uh, two monitors always, yeah. Yes, <laughs> also you know. I'm sorry. No problem. We are getting the gist of it. And thank you for bringing okay. the Manila principles. OK. Where can I see that? I mean, I cannot see this. Uh, or perhaps from the secretariat can help me. Just. Uh, uh, let's finish up. I think we have uh, understood quite well. Okay. And what I would suggest is that you share your slides and we can okay. catch up with them afterwards. But please continue. Uh, how about this now? I think, sorry. Let's, let's continue this way. I can see Indonesia and Singapore uh, on the screen. Okay, so the Singapore and uh, yeah, okay, Singapore and Indonesia. So we have two, uh, in, in Indonesia, we have many regulations. But what is uh, what 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 re really relevant is the electronic information and transactions uh, law, and under that is the government regulations on electronic system and transactions, and below that is the minister regulation on private electronic system. And in Singapore in 2019, we know that Singapore launched this protection from online falsehood and manipulation act. I think one of the key problems or key issues that I would like to address here is because the liabilities in these two countries, at least the way I see it, lies from the conduits to the host, this, that, and this also includes individuals. Um, that's, that's the point. Uh, and I would also would like to uh, share with you uh, from, from Diplo point of view or from Diplo summarize, uh, there are several ways in implementing uh, content policy. One is government uh, filtering of the content, which is government create an internet index for website uh, to block uh, for, uh, of website to block for for the citizen to access. The second is the filtering that can be implemented by yourself, the private rating and filtering system. Location, which is basically um, uh, decided by the government. Uh, or uh, by the court. One of the uh, cases that I remember is that a court uh, asked uh, Yahoo to ban a, a user from France to access uh, Nazi memorial memorials. And the fourth one is content control through the search engines. And this is not only from the government point of view, but also from the search engine itself. I mean, their algorithm and, and then their AI. The last but not least is the automated content control, which usually with AI uh, do, do by these, the, the uh, private companies. So what I would like to discuss here, Pablo, uh, this is my last slide, is which internet intermediary then can we be really be focused on? I think this is also relates with what KS was mentioning. There is a trend towards regulating specifically for the big platforms. And I think that it's more efficient rather than go to ISP or go to the individuals. Why? Because first one is the de facto they regulate the, the content, which is, is more effective and efficient 
to oblige them in taking down content from countering mis and disinformation. Of course, there has to be safeguards and regulations and proper transparent way to do it, transparent accountable mechanism to do it. The second is also they have resources. I think may, maybe nanti uh, later Bapak Farhan from the Indonesia government can from the Indonesian Parliament can also share. But there were discussions of uh, of the government or 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 policymakers in Indonesia to have this big surfer, which is we do have it now for filtering, but also taking down or you know get, get, get more access more than just just filtering which is i don't think we do have enough resources to do that i think the intermediary meaning the big tech platforms have more resources and the last but not least is they have this solid community guidelines and mostly well implemented i think um when nets dg uh, the content regulation from germany was was uh, started to be implemented in 2020 2019 2020 I think most of the most of the effective complaints mechanism because they have this complaint mechanism is uh, relating to their community guidelines aside and not the the Germany regulations. I, I think I would stop there, uh, uh, Pablo, and let's discuss what is the most efficient way to counter mis and disinformation in this region. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, Professor Park and uh, Sita. I think they provide a very good framing of the conversation from OpenNet and Diplo. And I would like to take it from there. I would like to uh, welcome uh, Minister of Communications from Lesotho, Ntati Murosi, and uh, Pak uh, Farhan as well, a member of parliament from Indonesia. They both joined the Zoom, and I would like to ask if possible to uh, be on camera so you can also be uh, as part of the room. And um, I would like to suggest uh, Richard uh, to start the conversation, uh, followed by Pak Farhan, and then I uh, would love to hear um, Minister of Communications from Lesotho uh, afterwards. Is that a good order? Let's start with you, Richard. Thank, thank you, Pablo. Um, look, conscious of, in a sense, time, and there are a number of other people that would be good to hear from. Um, so I think we've heard a couple of things which are really useful framing of how difficult this is. Um, what I might do is give you a sense of how, at least here in Australia, we've had a having a go at seeing if we can tackle this and address some of those or grapple with some of those challenges that have been laid out already by previous speakers. Um, I think the, the first point I want to mention or the place to start is we are looking at this through the, in Australia, it's coming at it through the lens of the, of the harms that can be caused, in a sense, harms that can be caused to the, um, to the community, to, um, to the Australian community, whether it's in the form of sort of social division and eroding trust in democratic institutions, undermining public safety or public health efforts, um, or even um, with respect to uh, foreign interference in Australia. And it's, <clears throat> The starting point in Australia has been um, to think about it from the perspective of those types of harms. The second point I want to make is the other that I think is quite important here is in terms of tackling um, some of those harms, whether it's concern threats to public health, concerns to democratic institutions, et cetera, et cetera. There is, there is more that can be done beyond just tackling this and disinformation on, on digital platforms. Uh, so for example, there is, you know, you can counter mis and disinformation by making sure there is lots of good, easily available, high quality um, information of integrity out and available. You can, um, uh, so in that context, in the Australian space, there are, it is important that we not only look at what you can do to counter the dis and misinformation, but what you do in terms of ensuring you've got um, quality, um, high quality information available and that goes to things like um, in our case uh, the funding of independent national broadcasters providing high quality public interest journalism for example um, equally education in um, programs that might be run by our office of the safety commissioner or in other portfolios work that might be done to put out positive um, uh, authoritative information on on um, 
on matters of public health, for example. So it's not, it, if you think about it from a harms perspective, it, countering mis and disinformation is not an end in itself. The real question is what role does that play in the overall ecosystem in trying to tackle, um, trying to tackle a range of um, possible harms. The, um, the final one I suppose I should mention in terms of other activities is that often talked about space of media literacy, um, which I think comes up quite frequently in these kinds of conversations, how do we help our citizens be well placed to understand and be able to um, make judgments and sensible judgments about the information that they are consuming or, um, or encountering. Um, so that's you know, that's that's the sort of world in which, uh, or some of the points that I suppose are in consideration in the Australian context. To sort of jump to the point, um, Australia, what we have done in Australia is just recently released a draft piece of legislation uh, for consultation. And that is a draft piece of legislation which looks to tackle uh, dis and misinformation. And really what I might do is just run through some of the key aspects of that um, and then uh, let others comment and react. Um, in effect, what we have done is provided in this draft bill where it's to be ultimately passed by the parliament is proposing to provide the regulator with a range of powers uh, which uh, fall into sort of three categories. Powers to um, uh, collect, uh, collect information, powers to require um, information to be retained by, um, by digital platforms and the ability to require or register an industry code or in certain circumstances, potentially even draft an industry standard. Now to do all that, you have to tackle some of the issues which have already been brought up, including some of the definitional issues. Um, uh, so what we have tried to work through, what we have worked through is thinking about if we accept that serious harm can occur and we accept that there is a, um, therefore, that is something that government should turn its mind to in terms of protecting community from harm, how and who should be doing that. Um, a couple of points I think are important in terms of the scheme that has been proposed in the Australian content uh, is firstly, this is not only about um, the removal of content. Secondly, it is not about the regulator having any role in judging whether content is dis or misinformation. Um, and I suppose, in, thirdly, we have landed in a position where the uh, expectation is in the first instance, the, platform, the platforms should be the ones responsible for the content that is on their platforms that they are making available to their users. Um, and we're doing this in Australia against um, a background of already a number of voluntary steps that have been taken by the industry. And I think that's quite important as well. There is already uh, steps taken by the digital platforms in Australia to establish a voluntary industry code of practice that was um, uh, that has been signed up to by eight signatories in the Australian context that was um, launched in uh, 2021. Uh, and the code requires different, well, in a sense, will mean different things for different platforms, depending on the nature, nature of their business. But there are two mandatory pieces of that voluntary code. One is the signatories commit to implement measures to reduce the risk of harms that may arise. And measures can mean many things. It doesn't mean necessarily removing content from the platform. And secondly, signatories commit to release an annual transparency report dealing the measures, dealing detailing, sorry, the measures that they have in place to combat this and misinformation. Um, so whilst I think we would say that that voluntary code has actually been um, done some really good things in the Australian context, the regulator has identified a couple of aspects of it that could be strengthened, including some of the transparency provisions some, and some of the reporting provisions. And I think in some instances, the other thing we're keen to make sure is that there are appropriate dispute resolution and complaint mechanisms that are available. And in a sense, the new proposed bill is looking to provide the capacity to address any shortcomings that might exist in that voluntary code. Um, shortcomings in terms of those points I set out, are there greater requirements for transparency, for example? And the other thing is, of course, that voluntary code is only signed up to by eight signatories, and there may be other people that um, ought to be, or we judge ought to be bound by it. Um, so we released draft legislation in June uh, 
June of this year, and I've just uh, run a consultation process, um, and that has just closed. As I said earlier, would give the ACMA information gathering and record keeping powers, um, which would help us understand what efforts and is being done on the platforms already. Um, and then if voluntary industry efforts fail, the ACMA would have reserve code registration and standard banking powers that would be able to place obligations on the platforms to improve their systems and processes um, around tackling mis and disinformation. Obviously, one of the biggest challenges here is getting the balance right between protection from harms and preserving freedom of expression. And that has been something that we have wrestled with and tried to tackle in how we've designed this piece of legislation. The draft bill uh, has a number of protections in it, uh, which I think um, are very important. Um, they go to the fact that under this, um, well, they go to one of the points I have already made, and that is that it is not the ACMA, it is not our regulator that will be determining what is dis or misinformation, it will be the platforms themselves determining what, um, uh, what constitutes dis and misinformation. Secondly, we um, exclude professional news content. This is not um, an exercise in <coughs> dis and misinformation does not therefore for the purposes of our legislation enable uh, capture professional news content. And thirdly, it doesn't allow us to catch um, what we'll call electoral content for this purpose. And I think that's a very, that last one is a particularly important uh, line that we have tried to draw in the Australian context. And that is that the difference between participation in an electoral process and the integrity of the process itself. So um, dis and misinformation about an Australian election, for example, and how it's conducted. So people suggesting that, for example, perhaps misinformation out there saying voting is not compulsory in Australia, for example, is the sort of thing that goes to the integrity of the process. That is absolutely in scope of this um, uh, of this legislation and any subsequent industry code, um, but the actual participation in the electoral process itself by political um, by political actors is um, is not. Um, I think the other thing, couple of things I'll mention before giving the floor back and allowing us to hear from others. The, uh, key points um, to pick up a couple of things mentioned earlier. Absolutely, I can see the concern about being careful to not criminalise speech. This is this in the Australian context. That is something we have steered clear of. It doesn't go, it doesn't go down that path at all. Secondly, um, I've said this before, but it is important because it gets lost in the discussion. There are a lot of things, measures that platforms can have in place to tackle dis and misinformation and taking down content is but one of them. Um, there are other things that uh, they are able to do and it will be up to platforms to determine what those look like. Um, and probably the final thing I'll say is we is to keep in mind that in the um, that this bill is not trying to solve every problem and neither is it trying to replace a range of other existing laws that might exist. So for example, it doesn't um, it doesn't replace or change or affect the existence of the defamation framework that um, already exists in Australian law. Um, so I think, um, there's been a lot of public discussion about this bill in Australia over the last few months. We, it obviously isn't law in Australia at this point. It is only out for discussion and we are now working through that consultation process. But there are a few, some of those points I've just made about what it doesn't do um, and what it doesn't require have at times been lost in some of the discussion and I think are important to understand. So just to kind of go back and recap, key point is we are proposing to bring in some legislation. That legislation does not give government any power to actually assess the content itself. What it does do is give the regulator the ability to register codes that, um, developed by industry themselves, with, which must contain measures to deal with dis and misinformation, but it is not telling the platforms what those measures should be, and neither is it determining whether the content itself is dis and misinformation. And in, um, in particular circumstances, there is the reserve power for the regulator to be able to um, make a standard, but worth understanding it's being done against a backdrop of a well-intentioned and not, um, uh, not ineffective voluntary code that the industry has already established. And I might pause there. Richard, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I think that we're slowly building this bridge uh, and, and we're heading towards the political side of things. And we have with us 
uh, Pak Farhan, uh, who is a member of parliament, uh, but former broadcaster, uh, TV uh, announcer, very well known in Indonesia. So I would love to see your take. I hope uh, you could uh, catch some of the uh, previous presentations and importantly, if you can share your experience on this important matter uh, from the perspective in Indonesia. Pakuhan. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, again, I'm very sorry, guys. Uh, I'm a bit late because uh, I just finished my Friday pray in uh, Jakarta. Well, right to the point, uh, been listening uh, some point from Professor Park and also from Sita. Um, I think uh, it is very important to address some uh, of uh, important questions about uh, misinformation and disinformation right now. Uh, I would like to uh, experiment my thought to put this uh, the disinformation and misinformation against the democracy and democratic process that we are facing uh, right now. Well, I think I'm going to take most of the examples from Indonesia uh, and see if we can relate to uh, to the issue. If I am asked the question of how does this information and misinformation online spaces affect the region, I can say one of the biggest misinformation and disinformation effect that really hurts us it actually happened in 1999 in uh, Maluku provinces. We just getting out of our democracy reformation. And what happened was through religious group has been misinformed and disinformed that one group is attacking another group. That creates a civil uh riots that kills hundreds and uh create destability uh, destability in our nation and it hurts a lot and then uh, a couple of years ago a middle-aged woman complaining about the sound system used by a mosque that was too loud and disturbing her resting time. Her complaint was then posted in one of the social media platform, but then by a certain group of people uh, reposting her complaint and exaggerating it in so many ways it creates some chaos in the city of Medan in North Sumatra that led her to get prosecuted, accused of creating a chaos. And it's her, it's the woman who's complained, who was the victim of disinformation and misinformation. So uh, looking at that cases and uh, some uh, statistics that uh, I can share later in my presentation and I share the materials to everyone. Uh, it is really concerning of how hawks misinformation, disinformation, and lies are distributed among us throughout the digital platform. So what challenges do policymakers face when developing a legislation? When it comes to the fact that now people started to asking the question, can we legislate the content of a digital platform? Can we rule uh, the digital platform developer and the content creator, which is two completely different parties in this uh, situation, to really 
obey the rule of good practice in content creation in the digital platform. So long legislation and political process. Uh, there are five aspects of the procedures of making a law in Indonesia. First, submitting the ideas is both uh, from both sides. It's either from the government side or from the legislator side. And then the discussion, which happens to be a long debate because in Indonesia parliament and legislation process, there are no voting. Everything has to be agreed and consented and ratified with all the faction in the parliament plus the government. So some friends may find this a bit funny because we don't make decision through voting in parliament but there is no voting in Indonesian parliament. So it is not a common uh, practice. So therefore, uh, if all the procedure is fulfilled, then we can legislate the law. This whole procedure is a very time consuming process because there is always a dissent, a dissent between factions, even between the parliament and executive. However, this is very normal to have different views in democracies. Furthermore, what makes it more complicated is the decision making in Indonesia, applying consultation and consent. Uh, this is the principle that we adopt in our parliament. Everything has to be consulted and consented by everyone. In sum, because of its complexity, the issue and the problem in society will always be ahead of the law. This means the law cannot just be updated with the current recent dynamic situation in the society. So the last question would be, how can countries effectively, effectively address online disinformation and misinformation? The advancement of technology and the internet accommodate the practice of good governance, transparency, accountability, and everything. But ICT allows the government to connect with the public where they can provide information, improve public services, educate people, even mitigate the hoax, etc. To make sure that digital space is safe and secure, the government has some initiation two one raising public awareness through a digital literacy program this sounds like a utopic program but digital literacy program in indonesia is very important because in average the digital literacy index in indonesia is still lower than the southeast asia digital literacy index in average, in ASEAN, in Southeast Asian nation, is about 70%, and Indonesia is still 60%. That means the minister, the Ministry of Communication and Information in Indonesia initiate a digital literacy movement that involves the stakeholders, government, legislative members, public figures, private and societies that involve four pillars in the roadmap for digital literacy in Indonesia that consists of digital skill, digital culture, digital ethics, and digital safety. In fact, Statista.com in 2022 released a comparison of digital literacy index in Indonesia that consists of one, two, three, four, five aspects of digital literacy. Uh, first of all, four aspects of digital literacy. First of all, it's digital culture, digital ethics, digital skill, and digital safety. According to the survey by Statista.com, 
Indonesian Digital Literacy Index core increased. But overall, Indonesia's digital skill and digital culture have improved while digital ethics and digital safety in our archipelago have weakened. So digital skill, digital culture is growing, but the digital ethics and digital safety is weakened. This means the challenge that Indonesian takes the feeling of readers from different ethnicity, religion, political views more into account and they are better at double checking information from the internet compared to the previous year. However, Indonesian internet users have become less sensitive about posting content without permission or consent and less aware of importance of protecting personal information. So the responsibility from the platform owner or developer and other stakeholders of social media to overcome the dissemination of fake news, hot disinformation, misinformation, and any content that harm the law. Third and lastly, law enforcement to identify and make sure to keep the balance or the border on freedom of speech and expressing their opinions on social media has to put first in our mind. Thank you so much, and I hope we can discuss more about this. Well, Pak Farhan, thank you so much, yes. uh, especially yes. for uh, showing how dramatic examples in Indonesia uh, are um, producing a harm that needs to, address, to be addressed one way or another. Uh, with us, we have the privilege um, to have Honorable Minister of Information, Communication, Science, Technology and Innovation from Lesotho, uh, uh, Madame Ntati Murosi, and uh, we are thankful for your views and we're very interested to learn your perspective uh, from uh, that far side of the world, uh, respective to where we are today in Australia. The floor is yours, Minister. Oh, thank you very much. And I greet all the participants. Uh, it's a pity I couldn't join uh, in physical form due to the injury that I had over the weekend. Nonetheless, I'm glad to have been invited to this e e very important forum. And I think the topic of today to me as you know, I'm a parliamentarian, but I'm also a minister of communications. And the solutions for the topic of today are actually supposed to be coming from me. I am supposed to be the minister responsible for ensuring that we do something about misinformation. And I've been listening to uh, all the, part the participants that have spoken today. We sort of share the same problems that are caused by misinformation. In Lesotho, I think it has eroded so many values and so many cultural ethos that uh, make Basotho to be who they are. And I think it's not only in Lesotho, it's actually in, in the rest of Africa. In the political uh, landscape, it's very bad. What happens is that we, 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 don't, we, ne we are never sure of what is news and what is not news. And our journalists, the problem that is now growing is that journalism, they do not go out to find news. They just go onto internet and go onto Facebook, fake, fake accounts. And then you hear a story being published on radio, which comes from a, a fake account on, on, on Facebook. And really this is a big, big problem and it has caused a lot of problems. We have seen in the past where government was overthrown by misinformation. There was a, pl a platform that everyone was talking about in the country and it was a fake page. It was not people who were publishing on that page. We did not know them, but they would say things that were damaging to the government to a point where it got to a point where people lost trust totally on the government and government was overthrown. And the tendencies are continuing even now. And we, 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 we have put together a legal instrument, which is the cybersecurity uh, law, 
and cyber crimes law, which is getting a lot of resistance from, from people, especially journalists. Uh, no one wants to see that law being passed in parliament, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to be passing it in parliament when parliament opens, because we, we see a lot of crimes that are being committed online, especially with fake pages. And a lot of journalists are saying that we are going to be closing uh, their chances of uh, free freedom of speech and all that. But we really want to pass that law. But my question to the forum today is, is whether that is a solution, because I don't know how far reaching can, can this law really be impactful. Nonetheless, our plan is to have this law and make sure that before we, 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 we pass the law, or, or rather after passing the law, we, 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 we do outreach, outreach programs where we teach people about misinformation and disinformation and about the, the cyber, cyber, cyber crimes. It is very important that before we, we, people, we apply the law, people understand what type of crimes are going to be committed or are going to be seen as criminal as per, per the law. So that is where we are now. But really we've seen this, the damage of misinformation, even during COVID, people would be sending information that is not relevant, information that is not true, info, information that scare people, information that, that is, is not benefiting people at all. And we, we believe that cybersecurity law is a solution. And I don't know if I can really say that. I hope we can get to a point where we talk about whether the legal instruments, the law is enough or what else needs to be done. I'm thinking that also at the academic institutions like universities, we think that we need to have a way of having this as, a, as, a, as part of the curriculum, especially for journalists, people who have journalists and social anthropologists, people who, inter, and teachers, people who, who interact a lot with the public so that people can be aware of misinformation and disinformation. Um, I think I don't want to repeat much of what has been said because most of it is what we, we also agree on. And just to say that in, in Lesotho and uh, in a lot of African countries, especially in the SADC, we are pushing for the cyber security law, but I don't know if it is enough as a, as a counter uh, to counter misinformation. I would like to stop here if, uh, if you allow me, then I'll join the discussion as we go on. Thank you. Minister, thank you so much for offering that perspective. Thank you for joining. Uh, it must be morning for you, and I hope it's a beautiful morning in where you are. Um, so we have five minutes, and I would like um, to sort of uh, leave one minute each uh, for a quick reaction or takeaway in order to finish building this bridge between sort of the pr practitioners and researchers to the politicians. Mm -hmm. So I'll take the same order and I will start um, with Professor Park, if he's still around. I, I am still around, but I do want to um, hear from other people, um, at least a couple more people, uh one or two people at least from the audience uh and uh unfortunately I, I, we only have five minutes left actually four now i see uh and okay. um we won't have time to engage with the audience unfortunately but uh i want to leave I record see. of our discussions today uh and and hopefully they will be taken in consideration for further discussions okay all right uh i'll uh First, on Lesotho, uh, I think that cybersecurity law, depending on uh, what it uh, says, it can be um, it can be uh, backfiring. Uh, it can be um, it may open up uh, a new uh, can of worms that will interrupt uh, the media uh, ecosystem. Um, as to um, uh, Australia, um, I think uh, ACMA 
um, I mean, I want to commend the restraint uh, that you are exercising by not uh, not uh, intervening on uh, posting by posting a deliberation. That is good, but if the guideline, uh, if the code becomes mandatory on all platforms, that will also be um, that will also be uh, how should I say this? Uh, that will also have the same effect as a mandatory uh, takedown that can be again uh, abused by uh, successive governments. Now, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just, just, just one more point. I think what is more uh, about about data collection. I think data collection on data collection on voluntary takedowns by platforms is uh, uh, very important. But whether that data is shared with uh, uh, civil society and the users, uh, I think that will be a really important crossroad for all of us. Uh, in striking the balance between free speech and uh, uh, cybersecurity. Professor Park, thank you very much. Sita, you're next. Well, well, thank you very much. I think one of the things that most mostly relevant for, for, for balancing is the transparency towards accountability mechanism. I think that's one of the mechanisms that we can save. Uh, I gave you an example during the Nets DG uh, regulation in Germany. I think that though there are so many uh, fire uh, backfire towards that regulations, but the reporting mechanism at the end of the day from the platforms on which content they take down and which content they do not, it, it's highly much appreciated. There is always a suspicion from the civil society organizations towards the government and vice versa. I think this transparency towards accountability yeah so it has to be two point yeah transparency and accountability would be a, a better mechanism in my point of view to also to build trust thank you thank you back farhan 30 seconds what's your thank takeaway you. um i'm i feel related to madam minister morosi from lesotho i think yes we need to provide the freedom of speech but then again, according to our experience in Indonesia, uh, once you give the freedom of speech, there is a big price that you have to pay so-called digital literacy. Digital literacy will educate the people how to behave online. Thank you so Excellent much, Madam. Point. Thank you. Uh, Minister Murosi. We cannot hear you. Sorry, sorry. I think I think the issue of li digital literacy is very important, it, and it has to be underscored. Um, it, it's it's actually the gap that is there. We've got the tools, we've got the media, but people are not aware of the digital information that comes from the, the digital uh, platforms. It's very important that we we underscore the issue of digital literacy. Expensive as it is, but it's something that needs to be done. Thank you. Very true. Thank you. Very true. Richard, how useful was this panel? Uh, thank you. It confirmed all of the things that we have grappled with. Um, first point is this is hard. It's not straightforward. Um, so I um, sympathize um, and understand some of the challenges that have been put forward. Second point I would make is I think news content is of a particular type. Um, and there is other content that might be missing disinformation out there. But with respect to news content, I think we can't put all our eggs in. Uh, if, if quality of news is an issue, there are other things that need to be done um, or worth considering beyond just uh, rules or laws around missing disinformation, whether it comes to uh, ensuring a diversity of a media sector or professional standards for um, media organisations and journalists or, and or media literacy. Third observation would be that I think in this, in this, the important thing here is actually to consider it as an ecosystem in which a lot of people have a role to play or a responsibility. Um, this goes to my point that mis and disinformation isn't an end in itself. Really, what we're talking about is how do we manage um, or 
um, minimise harm to communities. Consumers have a role, media literacy plays in there, the media itself has a role and journalists have a role with respects to quality and standards and responsibility. Platforms, we would argue in Australia, have a role with respect to the content that is on their platforms and noting that in some instances they may be monetizing it. Um, and finally, I think government has a role and it's about getting the balance right in there, um, Australia. And so then I suppose my final point is to say, in Australia, we're having a go at it. Um, it'll be, we will very happy, I suppose, for all of people on the call to watch what Australia does um, and feel free to pick up the, um, uh, feel free to pick up uh, any of the positive points that um, you think come from uh, what we end up doing. So I, all I can say is I suppose watch this space and what, let's see what the Australian Parliament ultimately passes us, but Australia's having a serious attempt at trying to tackle this. Thank you very much. Uh, I think with that, I give this panel a close and hopefully we're on for a global movement towards countering disinformation while ensuring a free, open, interoperable, reliable and secure internet and respecting human rights, democracy and the rule of law. Easy done. We solved the problem. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Papa. Thank, Thank you, Papa. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Mbak Sita, terima kasih ya. Sama-sama Pak Farhan. Sampai ketemu lagi, Pak. Bye-bye. Well, believe it or not, dear friends, this was the last session of this marathon of internet governance discussions. And I sincerely would like to thank everyone uh, who spoke, who contributed to this parliamentary track. Uh, it's not easy to stay after four and a half days today until the end. Uh, and I, it seems that you have some impressive capacity and I really thank you. Uh, my colleague Celine uh, is in Geneva from the IGF Secretariat and she is the one who coordinated and organized this track together with, uh, as I mentioned, colleagues from the government, uh, colleagues from AUDA. And I sincerely would like to thank Celine. Rest assured, everything went perfect, Celine, and you can now finally have some sleep. Celine also prepared for me a two-pager of the key takeaways from the discussions of the parliamentary track, which of course I will not read now. I do have some mercy. Uh, I think it would be more uh, practical that we send you the output document by email and we sincerely welcome your feedback. Once we have your feedback and approval, we will go ahead and ask Dotasia to help us, well, APRIGF, to help us to publish that output document uh, on the website and we will do our best to um, disseminate that broadly to all stakeholders. Uh, certainly this is not the end, we're making a break uh, during September and I hope that uh, all of you that are here will be with us in Kyoto, ideally in person, if not then online. We will have a parliamentary track which is composed of a couple of sessions and we will be discussing similar topics as here but also a little bit um, different, I would say, because we'll, we'll be focusing also on the domain name system, on innovation, um, in addition to uh, trust, which will be like an overarching theme of the parliamentary track and the round table. All the sessions will be hosted on 8 and 9 of October, so that with purpose. And just one announcement, uh, that is that we, we indeed face challenges here to have parliamentarians in person, and I'm very grateful that we had them online. In Kyoto, we have quite a solid number of confirmations. So there will be members of parliaments from around the world in person participating, of course, also online. Um, and I think um, there is a difference when it comes about the, especially our engagement with the African parliamentarians in here, and that relates to funding. That's the main reason why we didn't have members of parliament from the region here. In Africa, we work closely with the German Development uh, Cooperation Fund, GIZ. Uh, unfortunately, we still do not have that uh, good partner for Asia and Pacific, but I hope that will change. So with that, thank you very much once again. Uh, great pleasure meeting you all, learning from you. And I wish you safe travels and see you soon in Kyoto. Thank you.